like I said, we are welcoming Meredith Hall tonight, and it is just a great honor and pleasure to have her here with us. I am um, incredibly excited to talk about beneficence um, and also hopefully talk maybe just a little bit about without a map. We might touch on that a little bit as well. Um, I think some of the themes overlap a little bit. Um, oh, it's just it's just a great pleasure to have you here, and I hope that that you'll read from Beneficence um, to start us off. Wonderful. So, thank you, thank you very, very much, Jen and Joe, who is taking care of all of the technical mysteries here. Uh, I do want to say just um, to start out, I seem to be my I have great Internet here, but I it's uh, glitchy for some reason. So I hope that you don't see any problems as I talk here. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure to talk to readers. I uh, it's just one of the greatest joys in the world is to talk books with people who love books. So thank you very much for having me here and uh, for to all of you for coming and being part of it. I hope I most enjoy a conversation. So I hope that you will um, maybe jump in. I don't know how that works um, with this, with what's going on tonight, but I hope that you will, if you have comments or questions any place along the way, I would love to have a real conversation. I greatly miss uh, being in person with these for these conversations. So um, I'm going to read uh, from early on in the book. Beneficence uh, is about a farm family. Uh, they live in a fictitious town, Alstead, Maine. And um, it starts in the late 40s. We are watching a family of five, a mother, Doris, a father, Top, and three children. The oldest is Sonny. Uh, he is about 14 when the book opens. Uh, the middle girl, Dodie, who's about 10, and a little boy, Baston. The book is, um, runs from the late 40s all the way to the mid-1960s. And it is told in, in three voices. So three people in this story uh, in rounds talk to us about the lives they're living and the thoughts that they're having, the, the responses they're having to the world. The book opens with Doris, the wife and mother, and um, it moves then to Dodie, this middle child, and then on to Top. And we move in that order order throughout the book, Doris, Dodie, Top. Uh, this is um, Top talking to us. And um, it's, it's a, a, a bit of an insight, excuse me while I find my place. It's a bit of an insight into how Top sees himself in the world. This is a family that lives uh, a very, very good life on their farm. They are, they not only love each other, Top and Doris are in love with each other and they love their children. They love this farm. The farm is very productive and it's very beautiful. It's a dairy farm. And um, they work hard at this farm and that work is part of what binds them to each other. And um, there is, uh, coming to them some great trouble and the reader senses something might happen but doesn't know yet that it is going to happen and what it is. This is top talking. This is uh, his last section in the opening before. Last winter on a cold, clear, early January day, Doris and I organized our chores so we could take the afternoon skating with the children on Johns River in South Brookfield. The ice was thick and we had had no snow since the cold weather really set in, so the ice was smooth and open. I truly loved to skate and the day felt as exciting to me as to my children. This was the place my father brought his own children when the drudgery of his work work life overwhelmed him in the dark early days of winter. That's not what drove me there, not, not too much work or the wrong work, but everyone needs a sense of cutting free once in a while, and Doris was quick to say yes. 
She and Dodie put together thermoses of hot chocolate and Beston and Sonny brought the sled from the shed. They waxed the steel runners with a candle stub and tied a new length of rope to the steering bar. All our outer clothes went behind the truck seat. Dodie got the place beside me and my hand and the truck filled with happy nonsense and chatter. John's River is really just a wide, slow creek with overhanging trees and brush protecting muskrat and beaver bank dens. I've always thought it was a very good place, especially for children, because it spools out forward, not like a pond or lake surrounding you, but a river of ice inviting you away. I love that illusion, that sense of the possibility of going on and away, turning your back and giving yourself over to what you can't see ahead. The muddy landing was frozen and someone, probably a trapper, had laid a good log down for sitting and a stone break for a small fire. Doris and I helped tighten the laces on the children's skates, Sonny always in new ones, and Dodie and Beston in his hand-me-downs. Dodie complained at the start of each winter about wanting figure skates like her mother's, but she had mastered hockey skates and seemed content once she got on the ice the first time each year. I seldom see Doris in slacks, but I complimented her saying, well, Mrs. Mr. Center, you are looking very handsome today. I could count on her to laugh and the children too. Oh, but I change into a beautiful princess at midnight, she said with her open smile, if a handsome prince decides to kiss me. My wife is a flirt, which no man ever complains about. Off we went, the sun glinting from the ice and the bare trees and the blue sky itself. I was happy the minute my skates hit the ice. This is something we never forget, the feeling of ice carved by our skates with a rasping swoosh it is a certain kind of freedom to not make steps, but instead to slide a leg forward, the other leg, the first again, and find yourself suddenly almost free of the world, skimming smoothly and effortlessly into the light. I felt a kind of euphoria, a real elation, and wondered for a minute if my children knew this kind of freedom yet. We circled each other, best in reaching sometimes for Doris's hand or mine, sunny and doting, doty breaking away and swooping along, their arms outstretched, their faces reaching the clean winter light. No one spoke or called out, our skate blades scraping loudly. The children dragged the sled out onto the ice and took turns, two of them stepping into the loop of rope like a harness and pulling the third fast along the river in wide sweeping arcs. And now they shrieked and laughed and taunted one another. I watched Doris pull out of their way and start her silent remembering of a girl's ballet on ice, the twirls and little leaps and hips swishing side to side to go backward. She smiled, embarrassed to be watched, but she didn't stop, which pleased me. And I turned away and did my own remembering, the boy hard at hockey, roaring low across the ice, feet pointing out to catch the ice and drive the body forward faster and faster. And when I gained a curve in the river, suddenly the sounds behind me became muffled and I slowly straightened and focused on the simple smooth glide of skates on good ice. The memory so strong, I had nothing to say about it. And I lifted my face to the sun and swoosh, 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 swoosh. In rhythm, I followed the shining ice. The noise and shouts fell behind me. Daddy, Daddy, where are you going? Dodie called. And the memory of skating and this moment of skating became the same act and I was gone. I let myself be gone, Dodie's call left behind. I went forward and I was alone. Swoosh, 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 swoosh. The sun was ahead of me, nothing was behind me. There were no needs and no expectations and nothing waiting for me. The river curved right and left and farther right, a ribbon laid here for me alone. A crow called from the top of a towering old stave oak and the sun shone purple against him. 
I did not rush, taking the river as mine, the silence as mine, the emancipating light as mine, my legs strong and the cold air now stinging my lungs, all mine with nothing secluding me or hindering me or binding me. And so I did not stop. John's river winds smaller and smaller. And finally, I knew that I had come a very long way from my responsibilities. And I felt a pang of worry that grew as I turned and pushed my way back. Now it felt like hard work and the worry grew to a guilt that was crushing and I resented and resisted it. The light had changed, a warning. And so I've found my family seated on the log, the day gone and cold, the hot drinks gone, the truck keys in my pocket. Doris said nothing, and I resented that too. The children told me that they were very frightened, that I had gone through the ice, and I said sharply, I didn't go through the ice. I have more sense than that. We rode home in silence with no one's hand in mine, and although I knew that was a child's rebuke, I was not filled with worry, sorrow about it as I might have been. Where had I gone, I wondered, that felt so distant from this family that I love and so sovereign? We are always forgiven and we made our way again and then again to an afternoon of skating, but we never returned to John's River as if keeping me from it would preserve us from some sort of sundering. Meredith, that was so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> your your writing is um, just astonishing. It's just so poetic and so um, precisely observed. It's it's very beautiful, and and that um, leads me to my first question, which is, I I felt like the book is so um, bucolic and so beautiful that it almost, well, I, I, I'm, I'm curious if it was intentional for you to sort of lull the reader into this sense of safety. Um, it's, it's, I don't know how many people have read the book, so I'm not gonna give anything away, but it's 60 pages in that the big event happens. This, this yeah. tragedy happens is, is relatively, far into the book yes and I just wonder like had that always been the way you had this structured or was this something that you came to later and what what was your thinking in behind that well I wish that I could give you a, <laughs> an answer that made me sound like a very practiced novelist but this was <laughs> this was my my first novel. And, uh, you know, I taught writing for many years at the University of New Hampshire in the undergrad and then finally the graduate program for many years. And I understood writing and I read a, just a lot. I have always read a lot. And I made the transition from writing my memoir to this novel, really thinking, you know, how hard can it be? You tell stories, they're true or they're not true. How hard can it be? So I went into this with no plan. The only thing I knew was that I wanted to write about a man who I, ima I, I imagined that something awful happened in this family. I knew that, I didn't know what, but something awful was going to happen. And I wanted to watch this man who I believed was going to respond selfishly and um, without regard for the effect of his behavior. I was thinking was that I was going to work out some questions I had about my own father. He was, um, he, he did not behave well in my life and caused a great deal of harm in the family. He was very absent. He, um, he uh, really, he, he simply kicked me out of his life when I was 19. And I realized as I headed into this, oh, I think I know this character. What I wanna know is what does this man think about when he lies in his bed at night and he considers what he did that day? How does he think about it? So that's all I knew as I went into this book. I didn't know 
I, I had no plan. I can't imagine ever being a writer who has a plan beyond that. I had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't know who the people were going to be beyond this man who arrived named Top. And um, so I just went into it truly without a, without a plan. I, I made the decision as I started that I would have these three voices. That's a very difficult project for a first novelist and I would advise a novelist not to jump in there. I didn't know that, so I jumped in there. Um, it spans a few decades. That's a challenge for a novelist. I wouldn't recommend it for a new novelist and that's what I did. So I, I did not, um, I write very privately. I didn't confer with anybody about the writing of this book. I disappear and I write and nobody sees it. I don't ask questions. And really, I think I would have spared myself a lot of grief if I had asked a few writers for some advice. Um, so it's a long answer, a long way of saying that um, there was no plan. I sat down to write. I thought I thought Top was going to tell this story. And instead, a woman named Doris showed up, his wife showed up, and she started talking on page one. And I, one of the beautiful things about that was that within her maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 pages, I understood that she was profoundly in love with Top. And, um, and liked him and respected him and trusted him completely. And that this man couldn't possibly be the man that I had thought I was going to write about or Doris wouldn't feel about him the way she, she did. So right from the beginning, I was learning what this was going to be about. And I had no idea where those early pages would lead. I didn't know, uh, I knew something bad was going to happen but I didn't even know what and I didn't know when. So I have to say, Jen, that it was, it really an unconscious writing. I, I, I just sat down and started writing. And uh, the book that you see is the book I wrote. It's not changed. It is the way I wrote it. So it's a, it was a, a strange, I don't know if I'll always write novels like this, or this is the first novel that I had inside me. And this is the book that had to be written. I don't know. I'll find that out. But uh, I didn't have a plan. So there are, I do notice though, in those first 60 pages, I hadn't understood how much I'm foreshadowing. There is a lot of foreshadowing in those 60 pages about um, Doris when the children in those first pages lock themselves in the milk room and she can't find them. And she needs top, but he's way off in the distance on the tractor and she calls and calls. Well, that actually happens again later. And uh, right. when she needs him desperately. You know, there and Top, Top and Doris both talk to us about their sense. Doris thinks that she that she can't protect her children from something that's going to come in from outside, and Top worries that he's not going to be able to protect his children because he carries something inside him that is going to fail them. So they announce these things right off the bat. Yes, yes, and there's there is definitely that, and it's a. I think the the setting is so pastoral though that yes. it's easy yes. to overlook that yes. I, yes. In, in a way that's very effective you know it was it was um like it was devastating when you get to the and so my next question is your your choice such that it that it was or maybe it wasn't <laughs> your choice when you were writing it but at some point you went back and decided to keep it that way of sort of not directly confronting the event that happens, yes. but sort of you, t so the book, this first 60 pages is the before, and then there's sort of a gap. And then the characters are looking back at this event that has happened. And I yes. just, um, I thought, I thought that was quite brilliant because, but my, my biggest, as a writer, the thing that I am always on about is avoiding melodrama and so like yeah, I, yes. I and so I didn't know if that was in, like intentional for you um but it worked yeah. for me yeah that's, <laughs> that's a really that's a really great question I think that um part of it is that I didn't feel um qualified to talk about this particular accident um it's huge and um I I think I decided 
um, without clearly making the decision. I think my instinct was that it really was larger than I am and I didn't know how to actually uh, describe these, this moment, this terrible scene. And so these three characters allow us to come into it from different perspectives as they respond to it. Um, the other thing is that each of these characters um, carries a deep sense of guilt about how this could have happened. Doris, as a mother, feels that it was from having children come in from outside, the classmates, the kids' classmates from town, come to the farm and play. That didn't happen very often. It happened very seldom. And here is a time that they've come and um, it, this accident happens while those children are there. And she feels guilty that she should have kept the world outside and then things would be okay. Tup feels guilty because he's allowed this circumstance to be a potential problem. And, um, and he carries great guilt that he's allowed this even to be a possibility. I think the hardest guilt is Dodie's. Dodie doesn't have a clear memory of what happens. And um, she clearly is traumatized by this terrible, terrible moment. And she doesn't remember. She questions, you know, where was I standing? And what was I doing? Was it my hand? And uh, we guess that she speaks for us best and is a little boy who becomes very silent in this book. He, uh, he really has very little to say and relies very much on Dodie to be his mother. His, their mother really goes into a universe that's apart, an emotional universe that's so distant. And Dodie ends up having to, to mother Bestin. And Bestin doesn't say anything, but Dodie allows us to wonder if Bestin also wonders if he was part of somehow in that play, he was the one who somehow did this. So I, I, I think in my own thinking, that's realistic. I think in that kind of trauma, um, people can only see their part in it and don't really have a clear idea of what happened. And yes. um, so I, I think it was, I think I was just following my instincts thinking this is, a, this will never, nobody will ever really know what happened in that moment. I think you have excellent instincts. <laughs> I, I, I think that was, um, I mean, there was so much I loved about this book, but, but that was one of the things that I really, technique wise, um, I, I think I said this in one of my earlier emails to you that I, I, a, a writer friend gave me this book and said, you have to read this. And and I had been hesitant to read it because without a map was so good. And I thought you couldn't, you couldn't <laughs> possibly write something else that good. Um, and so I, I wasn't sure you could do it again, but you did. Um, but when I, and I, I had said to you and I said to her, this is a, a writer's book. Like this feels like there's so much craft and technique in here and not in a way that like takes away from the story because I think it's still a reader's book too, but it's, 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 like I know you said you just you just sit down and write it but I imagine that there was quite a bit of like editing and and I, maybe you can talk a little bit about your process like so you sit you yeah. you don't give pieces of it out but you write the yeah. whole thing I write the whole thing so it took me a very long time when I after I was done with the memoir it took me a long time to even figure out what I was going to write. Ideas came and I rejected them over and over and over. And, um, and I suddenly had this idea, a, a neighbor um, in my town in Pownal uh, was plowing my driveway for me. I had a very long driveway. And when he was done with the long driveway, he would often stand and talk with me. And he told me a story as we do, this storytelling that I love so much. And he told me a story about um, a, a terrible event that his brother had witnessed. And it gave me the idea for this story. And I thought, okay, now I have it. And I have, I understand that the father and the mother are going to really fail their children when they most, when their children most need them. And I realized that what I loved about it was this, the moral difficulty of it. I wanted to tangle with a story that was morally difficult. And I think that readers often focus on Tup's 
uh, questionable behaviors. But I think that it's fair to also question Doris's. She, she says at one point, I have paid altogether too much attention to my own grief. And so I think that Doris is up for grabs in a way for some uh, questioning about the rightness of her behavior, although we feel great pity for her. Um, but I, you know, I, I write in this very private place. I listen to Gregorian chants when I write. I have a very beautiful, small, modest writing room and uh, I love it. It's my favorite place on the planet. I put on Gregorian chants and I listen to a many, many hours long loop that one of my kids put together for me when he heard this strange idea that mom likes to write to Gregorian <laughs> chants. So he gave this thing to me. I know it now, I've been writing to it for many years. I know it by heart it, oh. and uh, I sit down with my tea and I turn things on and I'm ready to go and I flick that switch and within a few, I don't know what measures of that music, it happens here too. I've been doing it so long and I am gone. I am out of this world and I'm in this place where words and language and the rhythm of language and thoughts and my heart and my, my deepest, deepest brain are able to live and I write from that place. And uh, I tend to do it for many hours at a time. I am just apart from the world. And, you know, as far as editing things, I am aware, I don't revise. I don't go back afterwards, you know, a week or a month or six months later, I don't go back and revise my work. But I think what I'm doing at the time that I'm writing is that I move forward and then I move back again. And I, I go back a page, pick it up and look at it again. And something might go and I pull something forward and then I push something farther back than that, insert it there. So there is rearranging, there's some deleting that goes on. Um, so I'm a slow writer in that way, but um, you know, I write probably eight or 10 or 12 pages a day and then it's, it is what it is, that's it, it's done. I don't know what else to do to it. And uh, when it's done, when the book is done. I will say with this book, um, I realized that, you know, I really honestly didn't even know how long the book should be. I, I just was not a practice writer. So I went back and looked at my memoir and that was a certain number of manuscript pages. And I thought, well, that was a good length. I'll make beneficence about that. And it, it was a good exercise for me because I went back and, and saw that there were these episodic uh, stories that really didn't need to be there. They were not adding what they needed to add. And so there was a time when I went back and stripped probably uh, 20 of those episodes out. And, um, and so I, I suppose that is a form of revision. I just decided they didn't need to be in there. And then the book was done. So that was it. So it's a, I, I recognize nobody saw it until I sent it to my agent. And uh, it, it, I recognize it's for a person who taught writing and organized our, my entire writing uh, 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 project with my graduate students around workshops, I recognize that I have a very strange way of writing. <laughs> so. it's, it's, um, it's, it strikes me as brave. Like, I feel like, um, without my, like, without my writing group telling me that I was doing a good job, I think I would have quit a long time ago. So like you, yes. like having yeah. that internal, um, bravery is, is commendable because I, I am a chicken. <laughs> no, I don't think, no, I don't think you're a chicken, Jen. I think that that's very realistic. And also, I think deadlines, people waiting for your work is a really great thing. It's a really healthy thing. I think having readers that know what you're trying to do, a reader is useless to you unless the reader completely understands what you're trying to do. And they can help you accomplish what it is that you're after. And I think that's invaluable. I think for me, I don't read. I, I can read poetry and I can read nonfiction while I'm writing this novel, um, poetry and fiction while I was reading my memoir, writing my memoir. But I find that I get easily confused by things. And I think those out, outside voices um, feel as if, I don't know, I haven't tried it, but I think they feel as if there would be a committee that would confuse me, 
you know. So I don't recommend it. I really don't. It's a it is an a writer's work is lonely enough, and writing the way I do is really supremely lonely. It's really a, an extraordinary uh, time of isolation. So I don't recommend it. So so that <laughs> you're, you're on to it. You're, Rosie put a question in the chat um, asking if you're working on another one, and she hopes you are. So uh, I guess that's, that's a good time for you to answer that. <laughs> well, um, so I seem to take a long time between books, if book one and book two is any indication. It took me a long time to find the story for book two. And uh, once, I, once I had the story, I was ready to go, but it really took me a few years. I blundered around for a few years. And um, now I never imagined, I actually think that I had a little bit of, uh, a little bit of felt some lack of respect for writers who go back and write sequels. But I actually am thinking that there are people in this book, there are two people that I would like to know, I, I, I need to know more. Um, you know, as I wrote this book, it's very fair to say that I loved these people as if they were my family. I have grown children and grandchildren. I'm in California now because of my children and grandchildren. We are close. I love them very much. But when I was in Beneficence, my family was Doris and Top and these mm -hmm. children. It was a very strange thing. And I experienced the joy that they shared and this profound beauty of this place that was my home during that time. It was it was everything I ever wanted home to be. And um, leaving them at the end of that writing was very difficult. You know, when this tragedy happens, when somebody dies in this book, I felt a, a really devastating sense of loss. And, uh, and then when I had to close the book because it was done, these people were gone to me. And maybe that's that's why I'm feeling such a strong desire to go back. But there are two people in this book that I need to know more about. One is Beston, this little boy I mentioned. He is, he's so silent. He's a beautiful, peaceful, sweet little boy who doesn't say much. And then he's quite a traumatized boy who doesn't say much. And he leaves home early. He leaves home unexpectedly at 16 years old and goes to Boston. And uh, so I'm interested in him he's a musician and I don't know anything about music so I I'm not sure how I would handle that I need to figure that out um, but I would like to know about Beston and there's another child a very small child who uh, really is a shadow in this book her name is Grace and um, I would really I'm very interested in, what, in who Grace is and how she comes to understand all of this story and um, and and see what happens with Grace. So I, th I actually potentially think there are two more books coming. I'm very, oh. very interested in. <laughs> Yay. Oh, that's wonderful news. <laughs> we are, we are. We are. I see and somebody we, waving yes to yes, Thank yes. you. Yes, <laughs> everyone's very excited. I, and really, Meredith, I think you just, to learn about music, you say, I'm Meredith Hall and I want to know about music. What can you tell me? And like musicians will talk to you because yes, that's great. You know, you're yeah. Meredith Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. But also, you know, I'm, I listen to a lot of music and I'm interested in it. And uh, I, I think, well, you know, it's, you know, one of the interesting things, if I write these sequels, uh, there's a question, would Beston ever come back to the farm? It's possible he never returns full time to the farm, he visits, but will he ever come back full time? And if not, I'm writing a very different book. And will Grace ever actually be part of this farm? If not, I'm writing a very different book. And I've had to consider that, is it the farm that holds me so profoundly or can I move with these characters to their new lives? So we'll see how this goes. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, that's really, that's very good news. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your influences. And I um, I had recently read a short story by Wendell Berry in Best American Short Stories. And that short story so profoundly reminded me of your writing that I wondered um, if Wendell Berry was an influence for you or who your influences were. Um, but 
Although hearing you say that you don't read, but may, probably you're still influenced from prior to when you sit down to write. Yes. Um, so I have to say the writers, so when I read really what I'm doing, and I encourage writers to do this, really what I'm doing I'm doing many things, of course. I'm, I'm looking, I think we all look for books that we can find ourselves in, books that have something to do with me. We're essentially narcissists as we do this reading. Um, and even, I think we long for it to be something new and unknown to us, and still we want to find ourselves in that book. Um, so that's part of what we're doing. But for me as a writer, one of the things I'm doing when I read is I look for permission to cut loose. I look for permission to not follow the rules. And uh, it's not, I don't even need to, to use their new rules. I don't need to, to break the same rules, but I love it when a reader, when a writer um, dares to break rules and says to me, just do what you do, do what you need to do, do what you want to do, that's okay. And so there are many writers, um, William Faulkner, from the time I was very young, was a writer who, did, I'd be long, decades before I ever knew. I didn't start writing until I was 56 years old. And so decades before I knew I was going to be a writer, I knew that William Faulkner had it. I just understood that he was doing something so huge and so brave on the page. And I carried that, I loved that. I think Toni Morrison reading Beloved, I can, I've read it many times thinking, how did she do this? How did she get us to believe there was a ghost? How did we move between the reality and the ghost and between now and a time that is confusing in the slave time? How did she do all this? And did she, did she have an outline? I don't think so. I think it's an organic thing that she built from inside. So it gives me permission to, um, to just uh, break time, really to, to not pay attention to time. Um, so there are these, there are, you know, many, many, uh, Marilyn Robinson is, yeah. I think she's just yeah. a stunning writer. Um, I just read a book by a South African writer, uh, Damon Galgut is his name, G-A-L-G-U-T. And he writes in many voices, the book is called The Promise. And um, it, it's uh, Elizabeth Howard actually runs a wonderful podcast, The Short Fuse. She interviewed me and she happened to mention this book and I pursued it. And it's just an incredibly beautiful book. And he moves between voices um, and dares to almost abandon a voice before he returns to it. And um, so I don't, I don't uh, have a lot of models for the, the multiple voices that I used in my book, but I do definitely. I think that, you know, I think what we read stays with us and it influences what we do. Uh, you mentioned Wendell Berry. So after uh, Beneficence came out, uh, a few people mentioned in their comments about it that it reminded them of Wendell Berry's writing. And Wendell Berry for me is a peer who writes fairly dry essays about uh, the environment. And I thought, hmm, I'm not sure this is going to be great. But I did, uh, I did go after his fiction and now have consumed one after another of his Port William stories. And they are very reminiscent of the work that I do. The, my, I think that Beneficence is a love song to Maine. It's a love song to rural Maine. It's a love song to a way of life that is still here for many families, but mostly gone. Um, it's a love song to land and the beauty that somebody, somebody gave us all this beauty. And it's a, a kind of prayer of thanks to all that beauty. And uh, I think that um, Wendell Berry knows all of those songs, you know, he knows that love, he knows that reverence, that reverence. And I too see reading his work, I love it. I'm happy in his in his Port Williams stories. And there are many of them. I think there are 15 or 20 of these books. So you won't run dry. Yeah, no. And I yeah, I would say to anyone who who likes beneficence to to try some of his fiction, he yeah, there's there is a an echo in there and in, in just what you said in this 
love of the land, of this love of home, and something about lost time, like a time that we don't live in anymore. Yes. That, right. that has, um, but it's not like sappy sweet, you know. Um, no, no. Actually, I, Wendell Berry, you know, I, I was very worried about beneficence when I took it to my agent. Um, I was very concerned that it would be seen as too dark a book. You know, it's, oh. it's, serious things happen in this book, hard things happen. And uh, it ended up, uh, my agent didn't actually sell the book. Uh, Josh Bodwell um, was the new editor at Godine Publishing, and he heard me do a reading from this book as I, as I was... Um, closing it up, coming to an end of it. And he approached me and asked if they could buy it. And um, when I first met with Josh about, about this book, I expressed concern that uh, it's, I said, you know, this is a dark book. And he was startled by that. He was really shocked and said, I don't think this is a dark book at all. It's titled Beneficence. It's not a dark book. It's, uh, I think this is a book that's filled with hope and love. A hard thing happens, but hard things happen in our lives. And so I was reassured by that. And I knew from that moment I had my right editor too. So yeah. Yeah. yeah it re, uh, in some ways reminds me of like Kent Huroff's books that yes. there's things that happen in them that are are dark, but the, yes. but the books are, are not. Like you couldn't really say that those are dark books. Um, Beth had a question in the chat. Um, she said, I loved without a map. One of the best memoirs I've ever read, and I'm looking forward to reading Beneficence with my book club soon. I was wondering what your process is with memoir. Did you feel you had to check with family members and people in the memoir and get their okay before the story was published? Or do you feel it's your story to tell and don't need to get anyone's permission to write your story? Great. You know, I just, um, I did a podcast with Domestica. I don't know if you people know about this organization. It's it's D-O-M-E-S-T-I-K-A, Domestica. I think it comes out of Eastern Europe. And um, it the website is in many, I don't think you can get podcasts translated, but the website is in many languages. And, um, and they actually offer online courses, I noticed the other day. But they have just posted um, an interview uh, that they did uh, with me. And I thought it was going to be about beneficence. And instead, they've cut... Uh, bits and pieces out of it and joined it with comments from two other memoirists and it's entirely about writing memoir and I think you would find it very interesting it's yeah. I think if you go to uh, Domestica um, uh, Meredith Hall I think that you would be able to find it um, but in that in that conversation with two other people, there was a lot of conversation about story making and uh, how, how we make story. And I think when I wrote memoir, I believe I am just so much a storyteller. Uh, mem this memoir is one story after another story after another story. I was not yet a writer. I had written two essays. I blindly uh, sent one off to uh, creative nonfiction, and they nominated it for a Pushcart Prize, and it won that. And that was enough to encourage me to apply for a $50,000 writing grant. And I took two years off my writing and sat down and said, yikes, they think I'm a writer, and I'm not. Uh -huh. No idea how to write. I have no idea what to do. And because I had written a person two at that point, personal essays, I thought, I guess I'll write a memoir. I guess I'll keep doing these personal essays. So really what I did was not write chapters. I wrote individual essays telling one story after another story after another story. And uh, the memoir um, took shape in that way. As I did that, I was very lucky. The Domestica podcast actually addresses this question of whether, you know, to what extent are we involving our family members in this? I was actually very lucky. My mother had died. My father and I had been estranged since I was 19 years old and I was in my mid 50s. So I had no obligation whatsoever to him. I had two siblings and I was not on great terms with them. We were quite distant, distant because of the situation with my father. I did decide they had a strong relationship with my father and I made the decision to protect them to speak responsibly about 
this division in the family that was them and my father and then me on the outside. I tried to be very responsible about that. So that left my son as the big question. And he worked very, very generously with me, agreeing to allow me to not only tell his story, but to allow his adoptive mother and father's stories, uh, including the story of his mother's death. And, um, and I, I showed him everything that I wrote and in that book and uh, made God his okay on it. He never, ever said no. He never once said no. So I think he's an incredibly generous hearted person and a, just a great believer in the work that I do. Um, but that's the only time that I did that. I felt that, you know, with a brother or sister somehow, with a child, and I, I intentionally did not write uh, about my, the children I had years later with my husband. Um, I didn't write about the divorce. I didn't write about their father. And uh, I made decisions about that. They show up in one of the, one of the stories about me killing chickens, uh, but really quite peripherally. And uh, I decided not to write about that to protect them. So it was, it was my first son who had been given up for adoption, who I felt absolutely an obligation to make certain that he was comfortable with what I was doing. Lovely. Um, I dropped the link for the podcast in the chat. So if anybody's interested in that Domestica podcast, it's, the link is in the chat. And um, we've got a few minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, I'd like to open it up for anyone else. I've sort of monopolized the conversation. <laughs> I always give very long answers too. I take a lot no, of time. They're wonderful. <laughs> they're generous and, and they're good answers. <laughs> Joe. And then Rosie. Well, this conversation has been an absolute pleasure and an inspiration. And I thank both of you and Meredith. This is great to hear about. I've been musing about what you said about not having an outline and not going back and thinking about what that means in terms of how organization happens in your mind because of course it does uh, mm -hmm. beneficence is a magnificently organized book and everything fits <laughs> into a, a piece with a kind of a, a reassuring little chink uh, it's wonderful but so i was wondering if if you, places are so important in beneficence. Yes. Places like the barn, places like the river that you read us about, um, all the particular places in and around the farm and in the, the town and so on. How does place work for you in your creative process? How do you think about uh, the geography of a story and, and its relation to a plot? That's a wonderful question and really, really well articulated. I think that um, I think that uh, my memoir took place in many places. I don't think place plays as significantly in my memoir, uh, except maybe in a, a chapter called Without a Map, um, the title chapter. But in this novel, um, for me, I think I projected a great deal my love for this place grew as the story happened inside this place. And um, I, I think the stories are inextricably connected to place. And I think these people and the character of these people, it, it's all, it's, it's inseparable from place. And ultimately what that place is, I, I truly, if I could return to that place right now and keep writing, if I could drag best in and found a profound kind of place in the universe. And it it was so fully imagined. It, it you know, I I knew what Dora's kept on the shelf by the sink, you know, it's just, and I'm not sure why that's true. Uh, 
it, I don't know why it is so, I know, I know, I can see everything. When I would describe, you know, the back pasture or the east pasture or the north pasture or the cornfield or the hay field, I could, I just knew where they were. I just understood instinctively where they were. Uh, so, and I don't know how, I, you know, I, I don't believe that I had another life or previous life in this place, but boy, it was a, it was home. It was absolutely home for me, yeah. A little bit of magic. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Rosie, you had a question. Yes. Um, I'm a huge fan. Thank you for appearing with Jen. Thank um, you. I read Beneficence uh, because it was the main public radio's choice. So yes. I saw you on that. And then I Thank also you. heard also heard you with Lily King. I think it was two weeks ago. Um, so thank you for all the time you've given to um, Maine Public Radio. That's just so super. And I've loved, loved, loved your books. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, MPBN has been very, very supportive. And uh, Christina Baker Klein, um, my editor asked Christina to blurb the, this book. And um, she, uh, she is very, very busy. She works very hard at her writing and she agreed to squeeze it in and fell in love with it and has appeared with me several times at events wow. to promote my book and also nominated my book and Fook Tran's book, uh, Saigon, the no as the nonfiction book for Read Me um, 2022. And um, so, but MPBN has just been great. They've been very supportive. This is a very good year for Read Me. If I mean, well, these two books that I just. Book is pretty love. wonderful. Yeah. Book is just wonderful. And two, these books are so different. And yet, they're, yeah, Fook and I have wonderful conversations together. Yeah. They are very different. That could take us down a whole other path, but because there, there are these themes of, of home and belonging and place. And yeah. anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. but I. I wonder, uh, you said that maybe you could, you would read a little bit at the end. We only have a, yes. a few minutes. Um, okay. I would love if you would do that. Okay, this is, uh, this is Doris speaking and it comes at the very end of the book. So what happens in this book is, um, Jen is right, those first 60 pages are, um, it's a joyful world. It's a joyful life this family shares. 60 pages in this terrible thing happens and it really knocks the family crazy. And uh, it's a very, very difficult time for them. And very slowly, for a long time, they're not able to find their way out of their grief. None of them are. And then slowly, 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 things, um, they grief, you know, uh, generally, I think for us, grief eases and uh, sorrow lifts. I think we're given a great gift of time. Time allows us to move through these events in our lives and come out on the other side with hopefully some sort of wisdom. So the only thing you need to know here is that um, Bestin is the youngest child. He's now in his 20s and is back at the farm visiting. And there's a new, uh, there are two new members, Dodie, the middle child has grown and she has married Daniel, who was there that day that these terrible things happened. He was Sonny's very best friend. And Dodie and Daniel have a little boy uh, named Thomas, named after Sonny. Last night when we rose from the table, Best said, let Thomas and me wash the dishes, which the boy does enthusiastically. And the rest of us stayed at the table while they washed and dried and put away the dishes Tup had eaten his own suppers on when he was just a boy. Then we moved to the porch and put the lamps on and Tup read aloud to Thomas while we listened. Bestin went into the front room and opened the window to the porch. He sat at the piano, quietly picking out a melody. The music was soft and slow, a song about a man wandering back roads alone as the sun goes down. The trees stood in line along the road, sentinels watching over me, he sang. I was glad that Bestin feels some sort of protection. Thomas leaned against his grandy, his granddad, against his grandy listening. Later, Bestin came out to the porch and said quietly, that old piano needs tuning, but it is still my favorite one to play. 
He sat on the glider with his father and his nephew and folded his fine hands and listened while Grandy returned to Thomas's story. We climbed the stairs and put out the lights. Pup and I lay together in our dark bed, his hand in my hair, his breath on my shoulder. The spring night was cool and damp. Listen, Pup whispered, there is so much. Partridge drummed from the edge of the woods and the spring peeper chorus rose from the pond and overflowing creek. We have lain together in this bed for most of 32 years, listening to spring rising on this land, my husband said quietly in the dark. The cows slept with their calves in the safety of the barn. The night offered all its promise. Pop and I moved to each other our heat and our weight and our devotion. We slept without guard. There is never a going back. What we say and what we do stays, always. The great price of love and attachment is lost and with us every day. But here too, each day are their great easings. And I'd like to add to this Dodie in her last, um, her last section of the book says at one point, this kind of happiness requires courage. It requires a willingness to love, a willingness to forgive, a willingness to believe in some sort of goodness. It requires that we each accept what has been lost and offer ourselves to what we have now. Closing out beneficence. That is a lovely, lovely place to end. Thank you so much for being with us, Meredith. This thank was, you. This was a joy. So thank, thank you, you. Jen. It, I greatly appreciate the invitation. I've been looking forward to this conversation with you. I knew we were going to have a good conversation. Thank you so much. I want to wish you well with your with your Owen Leach book. I hope that it carries out into the world and lots and lots of people see it. So oh, thank, thank you for the invitation in the midst of your own very busy schedule as you take your book.